Face at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. New audio obtained by the KSAT 12 defenders raising more questions tonight about the timeline of law enforcement's response to the Uvalde school massacre. As the scene commander believed they were in a standoff with the shooter, parents of children at Robb Elementary and the district's other campuses received a far different message. Dylan Collier explains. <laughs> As the deadliest school shooting in Texas history unfolded one week ago. Somebody jump out the window. Oh, the kids. the kids. They're getting the kids out. Parents of children attending Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District campuses received the following message on their phones. Uvalde CISD parents, there is an active shooter at Robb Elementary. Law enforcement is on site. Your cooperation is needed at this time by not visiting the campus. 45 so seconds of information exactly. confirming an active shooter received at 1220 p.m. Based on the timeline of the massacre, the message went out as law enforcement continued to hang back and not engage the shooter as one 911 call after another was made from inside the building. Once we do get some information that we can... Officials read, last week confirmed the commander on scene, no UCISD get, Police uh, Chief Pete Arredondo, kept officers from breaching the classroom and believed the incident had transitioned to a barricaded subject. Of course it was not the right decision, it was a wrong decision, period. There's no, no excuse for that. As new cell phone video obtained by KSAT today shows the rescue efforts unfold, the question must be posed. Why did Arredondo consider it a standoff when his own district was telling parents it was still an active shooter? And we are still waiting for an answer to that question. District officials today did not make Chief Arredondo available for an interview and did not respond to an inquiry about the message that went out to parents. Arredondo was supposed to be sworn in as a Uvalde City Councilman this evening, but that meeting was postponed. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. The Department of Public Safety releasing some new details of what happened leading up to the gunman getting inside of Robb Elementary. Previously, they said the shooter got into the school through a door that a teacher had propped open with a rock and that was not removed before the shooter arrived. But today, investigators say they have determined that is not what led to him getting in. Yeah, now they're saying that the teacher who propped the door open removed that rock and closed the door when she realized there was a man with a gun on campus. But apparently, the door did not lock. That teacher has not been identified. And in Uvalde today, the community is standing more united than ever as they prepare to say their final goodbyes to the lives lost in the Robb Elementary School shooting. The victims have all received custom caskets, flowers for the funerals donated to the families, and the memorials continue to expand tonight. Our Alicia Barrera is outside of Robb Elementary where people continue to arrive and pay their respects. Alicia. Good evening. Well, earlier today when we got to Uvalde, we drove around through the town and really visiting those two funeral homes. And really what we noticed was a heavy police presence just surrounding that entire area where some of those classmates and families started to make their way in. And we're told that visitations were private at first for immediate family and then later on in the day for extended family. The funerals are all private. And today, of course, they begin with 10-year-old Amory Jo Garza, who will be laid to rest at Hillcrest Cemetery. And about an hour, the funeral services for 10-year-old Maite Rodriguez are set to begin. But here outside Robb Elementary, strangers are united in grief and in prayer. You have people coming from all over the nation, uh, from all over Texas. But the majority of who we met today are educators. And they say they want change and are actually terrified that something this horrific and traumatizing could happen anywhere, no matter how big or small the community may be. And we met one educator from San Marcos, and she admitted she now thinks about what she would do if she was ever in a similar situation. I would just have to like practice how to grab my phone and run in there just to be hopefully the first ones to call 911 and hopefully to it won't be as bad as it was here. These kids and it's just heartbreaking how you see these beautiful faces and some of them who wanted to be teachers, some who wanted to be in me, it's it's just so hard. 
it's so hard for anyone in the community or beyond to wrap their heads around what happened here a week ago. We also met a survivor from the 2019 Dayton, Ohio mass shooting. His name is Dion Green. He arrived this afternoon to Ovalde and says he'll be here for several days with the goal to meet the 21 families and help them guide through what comes next. And I thought that was very uh, powerful because this is something triggering for him, but he wants to be able to walk these families through what comes next. And he says it's just heartbreak. What's happening now, right behind where we're standing, a mural is going up, tributes continue to pour in, and tomorrow, about 40 mariachis all the way from San Antonio will make their way here to Uvalde to provide some healing through music. Reporting live in Uvalde, Alicia Barrera, Keisa, 12 News. Thank you, Alicia. Maite Amari. Remember their names. One of the kids wounded in Uvalde and brought to San Antonio for treatment is back home this evening. Ten-year-old Noah Orona was released from Methodist Hospital late yesterday. Three other patients are still being treated at the university, according to the hospital's Twitter. The 66-year-old grandmother now in good condition, along with a nine-year-old girl at university, a 10-year-old victim there, remains in serious condition. During this time of shock and grief, so many people turning to counselors to help them navigate all of this trauma. Counselors like Ashley Jesse with the Children's Bereavement Center. She's cared for Sutherland Springs shooting survivors for years, and now she and her fellow counselors are helping in Uvalde. But the weight of these devastating shootings becomes heavy, even for the professionals. So they're now working to keep their own mental health in check. Doing something that you enjoy, it's okay to do that. It's especially important to do those things when we're grieving and when we're overwhelmed because it helps us to regulate our emotions and, you know, being around our family, our pets. Um, like I said, doing things that we enjoy is important. She said many counselors have their own counselor to help them compartmentalize secondary trauma. Jesse said it also helps to talk with colleagues and friends about her feelings. They do at six San Antonio police training with a new tool for responding to active shooter situations. It's actually an app that schools, churches and businesses can use and which claims to be able to cut down on response time and help manage the confusion at the scene. Our Garrett Berger shows us what it does. Three, two, one. In an active shooter scenario, every second counts. This may shave two, three minutes off of response time. And imagine how many people somebody could kill in one, two, three minutes. SAPD's SWAT team gathered at a church in Northwest Bear County to try out LifeSpot. LifeSpot CEO, a former Denver SWAT officer, says the app will put the user who sounds the alarm directly into contact with 911 while also notifying police officers with the app and every user at that location. And it sends an alert uh, to everyone that needs to know, once again, in less than six seconds. After that alert goes out, app users can mark off if they're injured, if they were able to get out, or if they're hunkering down. And they can provide information on the shooter directly to 911 or police. The idea being the info would get through more easily than it would in a flood of 911 calls. We were getting reports of the shooters in the pre-K room. SAPD is getting the app for free, and they plan to move forward with it, though just with SWAT for now. But any schools, businesses, or churches that would actually put it into use would have to pay to subscribe. Depends on how many users. We're anywhere from 30 cents a user per month to a couple bucks. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus says this was set up before the school shooting in Uvalde. And at first blush, says it seems like a good app for police or a venue to have. Does it come at a, at a, at a time when uh, it seems like it would be even more valuable? I guess the question, the answer to that question would be yes. Chief McManus says it's probably a discussion to have with SWAT commanders before they decide whether to put this on every SAPD officer's phones. And he also wants to talk with them before making any recommendation for schools or businesses to go ahead and get the app. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Check out traffic on this Tuesday. And we're going to go to I-10 in Frio near downtown. And you can see they have a couple of lanes or one lane there coned off. Not sure exactly why, but you can see they do have it coned off there. Maybe there's a stalled vehicle or something a little further up the road. It's causing a bit of a backup at I-10 in Frio, which is usually very busy at this time anyway. Let's take a look outside through another view. Our live cam here looking at the skyline of downtown. 96 degrees right now, but of course, Adam, it was even hotter than that earlier. 
Yeah, 99. That was our high temperature today. Not quite record breaking territory, but we felt the heat, of course. Currently at the airport right now, 95 degrees. Dew point is 64. But here's the key. The wind steady out of the, out of the southeast at 18 miles per hour, gusting at times around 30 miles per hour. You look at the most recent gusts. Hondo 25 miles per hour. Stinson on the south side. 32 mile per hour gust and these are again just the most recent gusts and this wind is going to stay elevated through this evening on into the night. I mean even at 2 a.m. we're talking gusts around 26 miles per hour. So remaining windy through the night tonight. Otherwise warm and humid with low clouds increasing 10 o'clock 82 degrees by midnight. We're dropping down into the 70s. We're going to talk about some potential tropical development and how this May is going to go down in the record books around here coming up. KSAT 12 celebrates Military City USA, powered by USAA. San Antonio is known as Military City USA, where every enlisted Air Force recruit starts their basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. What's it feel like to be It's eight weeks of training that transform a civilian into a United States Airman. And so this is where their, their Air Force career starts, and then it's also kind of the gateway into going further into their Air Force career. So they start here and they graduate here um, throughout basic training. Well, they put blood, sweat, and tears onto all these drill pads, um, changed who they are as an individual to become a better individual here at Lackland Air Force Base. And on graduation day, just seeing how proud everyone in the stands is, how much taller they stand up on graduation day, how much taller you stand up as well. Just seeing that they they set their mind to something and they were able to accomplish it. And now they're going to go out and do amazing things for our Air Force. Tonight on the night, be taking a closer look at the renewed debate on gun control. House lawmakers plan to consider new legislation. Why one political expert does not expect things to change. And helping save lives can come at a cost, especially for those on the front lines of traumatic events. The unexpected support system some doctors and nurses at University Hospital are finding after Uvalde. It's tonight on the night beat at 10. One week ago, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center already had blood on the way to Uvalde to help the victims of the shooting. And people are still stepping up to help today. But as Max Massey reports, the organization says it is still not where it wants to be. Unfortunately, just living in this current day and age, you hear and you see a lot of the trauma. Lillian Jeffs is a nurse and she knows firsthand just how valuable blood donations are. And she knows how easy this process is to help out. It took me like seven minutes to come in, fill out the paperwork, donate the blood, and now I'm done. And I've saved, quite possibly saved a life. In the aftermath of the shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, South Texas Blood and Tissue Center was ready to respond. This is the, the fourth time that we've actually had to do a, a mass, be part of a mass shooting here at South Texas. We, we knew the process of what we had to do as far as making sure there was enough blood. And since the news of the shooting and news of the victims, there has been an increase in blood donors. We saw um, over 2,500 donors come through our doors um, here in, in, in San Antonio and in Uvalde area. So. It is a quick and easy process getting set up to donate. And yes, we've seen a lot of community members step up and help out over the last week or so, but we are still not at where we need to be. Uh, ideally, we would like to have a, a seven day supply to adequately supply all those hospitals that we serve in those communities. Like I said, it's 48 counties, over 100 hospitals and clinics. That's how Texas serves. As for Lillian, she donates every eight weeks doing what she can to make sure there is enough blood to help in whatever life-saving situation may come up. You do it to help others and that's despite whatever else they may give you a shirt or a gift card, you do it to help. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. All right, let's turn to the weather out there now. And are we, I think we're at the point of the year. We just say, okay, how hot's it going to be? I know. It just seems that way. Yeah, is it going to be a record? Uh, yeah. That's Where the question. We? Yeah, exactly. Is, is it going to be uh, like that? And, you know, we are going to feel the heat, of course, in the days ahead. And you will notice uh, record. Hold on here. This computer is giving me something. Oh, there we go. A few extra clicks. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me, everybody. Computers, you know. And three, two, one, half. <laughs> 
quarter. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, it's like it's Monday all over again for yeah. me, right? All right, today, 99. That was our high temperature. The average being 90, the record high, 104. So, yeah, it was hot again and well above average, but not quite record-breaking territory, where I do think we will get into record-breaking territory in the days ahead. Circling back to, is it going to be a record or not? Uh, take a look at our forecast here. Mid-90s the rest of this week, Saturday up to 98, Sunday 100. The record would be 101, so obviously within reach. Monday, we're forecasting 101. That would tie the record for the day. This month of May is going down in the record books as the hottest May on record. So far, 1996 was the hottest May with an average temperature of 81.9 degrees. So far this May, and this doesn't even take into account today yet, 82.8 degrees is our average temperature, and that's about six and a half degrees above average. High temperatures, uh, featured eight records throughout this month and I mean it's a it's it's a given that we're going to go down as the hottest May on record. We won't have the official data until after midnight tonight, but that's the way it's going to it's going to go down. As for the driest May, no. Yes, it's very dry. I mean 0.86 officially at the airport, that's three and a half inches below average and year to date we're almost nine inches below average, but this comes in tied at the 10th driest bay on record. I believe the driest was about 12 hundredths of an inch of rain officially at our at the airport, but uh, this this will be about the 10th driest. So let's talk about the big picture. We had a few little sprinkles closer to the Gulf Coast earlier today. Right now the activities parts of the Panhandle on into western Oklahoma as well. That's the severe weather activity, likely some large hail with some of those thunderstorms that have been flaring up severe storms. What we're talking about now, remember yesterday we talked about Hurricane Agatha that came on shore in southeastern Mexico, so that was a Pacific system, a Pacific hurricane, Cat 2, hit yesterday about this time. The remnants are right here. It's mainly just a lot of moisture in the atmosphere with a little bit of a little bit of a circulation to it. Well, this is likely to, to turn into a tropical system in the Gulf. I mean, not even necessarily a hurricane, but tropical depression, maybe a tropical storm. If it did, it would become Alex. But in, over the next five days or so, it's gonna move over the Yucatan and into the Southern Gulf, maybe Northwest Caribbean, closer to Miami and Cuba. 70% chance of that becoming at least a tropical cyclone, not necessarily a hurricane, but it could get the name Alex. The moisture, unfortunately, staying away from us. Around here, 10% chance tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, a 20% chance of a few rogue pop-up showers, both briefly in the morning, then again, possibly in the afternoon, but odds are slim. Temperatures, this is gonna be a familiar sight. I mean, well into the 90s now, you value right now 94 degrees, 95 New Braunfels, 97 in Divine. Tomorrow we start the day at 76. There's that whopping 10% chance of little streamer shower closer to the Gulf Coast. By the noon hour, we're up to 90 degrees. We'll get rid of the low clouds, have the sunshine into the afternoon, and then a 10% chance later on in the day of a brief shower downpour popping up. Tomorrow, Hondo 95, New Braunfels at 94, Canyon Lake about 92. And there's that heat as we get into the weekend, back up to the century mark, especially by Sunday. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, so we have some Spurs news. Greg Simmons joins us now. Well, right. after it was approved, they are going to play one of their games in Mexico City. We didn't know when or who they would play against. Now we do. When we come back, the Spurs are headed to Mexico City during a regular season home game now. That's different. And the Rattlers are ready for a Region 4 title run coming up. San Antonio Spurs will face the Miami Heat when they play one of their home games this coming season in Mexico City. That's according to Record, a Mexico-based website that says the game will be played on December the 17th at Mexico City Arena. More on this tonight on the Night Beat. The Reagan Rattlers will face Lake Travis in the Class 6A Region 4 Finals starting this Thursday to decide who gets to go to state. The scary part for Reagan is that they were down 7-4 only to rally, and Brent Moore came through with his game-winning two-run single to lift the Rattlers to an 8-7 victory over Eagle Pass. Now Reagan will put their 35-1 record on the line against Lake Travis, 33-5-3 record. The Rattlers working out today to see if they can keep their undefeated record going in the playoffs. You know, they're a good team just like us. Played them earlier in the year, but we both obviously progressed since then. Um, but it'll be, it'll be a great series for sure. Um, they're good, we're good, so we got to go play.
fifth round, you know they're going to be good, and uh, but I know that we're good. Um, uh, I think it's going to be a great matchup, and I can't wait to see what happens Thursday night. All right, the best of three series will batter up on Thursday at 7.30 p.m. at the Northeast Sports Park for Game 1, followed by Game 2 Friday, 7.30 at Concordia and Lutheran. And if a third game is necessary, Saturday back in Northeast Sports Park at 6 p.m. For the fourth time in the last five years, DeHannis is playing in the UIL State Softball Semifinals at Red and Charlene McCombs Field today in Austin. They face Dodge City in a rematch of last year's title game. Cowgirls get on the board first. In the bottom of the first as Reese Redden sends one deep to the gap in left center. Ryan Major scores the opening run. DeHannis leaves 1-0 after 1. Bottom of the 5th. Base is loaded and Kayla Looper comes through with a base hit into left. Tony Burrell scores to make it 2-0 and senior pitcher Marissa Santos slams the door striking out 10 batters in a 3-hit shutout effort. DeHannis wins it 2-0 will play for the state title. That was like the goal like make it to the finals. Like that's what we've done every single year and that's it. I feel amazing that I get to finish it off there. It's a tribute to them because they take it upon themselves to say, okay, we're going to do this and not question or do any of that. You know, So it's, it's a very special group. It's a great feeling. I'm excited about tomorrow. All right, Dennis will play Hermley for the Class 1A state title tomorrow 4 p.m. Fight Texas Aggies are back in the NCAA tournament for the first time in three years. We'll host a regional for the first time in six years. During the selection show on Sunday, the Aggies were seated number one in the College Station Regional, with being named the fifth overall seat in the tournament. And they will face Oral Roberts in the first round beginning Friday at 1. Aggie head coach Jim Schlossnagel comes to Aggie Land from TCU, where he led the Horned Frogs to five College World Series appearances. Now there's a very good chance he can meet up with his former team if they both advance. When I took this job, um, I knew it could be a possibility. Uh, didn't quite expect it the first year, uh, but uh, obviously mixed feelings. I'm, I'm excited for them. I, f I feel like TCU was most definitely deserving of a host site. You know, any, I think anytime you win a league like the Big 12, you're, you're deserving of hosting. Um, I'm excited for, for uh, those players. I mean, I love those guys. The, um, still love them to death and uh, wish them the best of luck uh, with the exception of the times that, that, that if, if we play. Uh, but that's part of it, and, and I knew that was that was a possibility. Being staying in the same region. All right, the Aggies are 37-18 overall. The Horn Frogs are 36 and 20. But first, A&M has to get by Oral Roberts. TCU has to get by Louisiana Lafayette. That would be quite the reunion if would that happened. Would be very interesting. Yes, it's a very it interesting be. matchup. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. It's been exactly one week since the deadly mass shooting that claimed 21 lives at Robb Elementary in Uvalde. In today's KSAT Q&A, as we were last Tuesday, we are joined now by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg. Uh, Mayor, thanks for being with us here. We know that on Sunday when President Joe Biden and the First Lady uh, made their way to San Antonio and on to Uvalde, you, you greeted them and then you, you yourself went down to Uvalde. Talk about meeting the president uh, during that time and just any words that you all exchanged and, and your experience traveling down there? No, I mean, uh, when, when uh, the president and first lady walked off the plane, um, I was struck uh, because they looked very sad uh, for our community. And, and obviously I welcomed them to San Antonio, which uh, again is family with Uvalde and uh, appreciated them uh, being here and on behalf of the entire country, showing the support uh, for our neighbors. Uh, you know, the scene in Uvalde uh, obviously is still very somber and, and, and sad. And, and we've got a community of, of family members, direct family members who are grieving, uh, just uh, unthinkable um events that have unfolded there and and so there's a lot to be done and and i go back to what we talked about last week steve and myra that our community because of the fact that we're family with uvalde in many ways uh, what we can do best to respond is to wrap our arms around uvalde and give them the care and understanding and support that they would need in any other in any way and and that's exactly what's happened if, if anyone has spent time in Uvalde over the last week, it almost feels like you're in San Antonio. There's so many uh, neighbors, uh, co-workers, friends, relatives who are out there now in support of our, our neighbors in their time of grief. Absolutely, I noticed that on, on Sunday when I was out there, and I know you were at the, at the same memorial I was at, at uh, uh, Town Square Park. 
Uh, when you see those crosses, you see the flowers, you see the candles. Uh, I'm curious, it, it's, it's a very powerful image at both of those memorials, the one at Robb Elementary and the one at the park. Yeah. What, what was going it, through your mind as you were standing as you were standing there? Just how awful it is that we are are here and we're here again. And as I've expressed frustration before, uh, deep down, we believe we will be here again unless things change. What I what I really tried to do when I was there on Sunday was to read each and every one of the memorials and the notes that were re left mm -hmm. at the crosses. Um, and it, it's gripping. You know, I, I remember reading several of the notes from their friends, their classmates. Uh, one of the notes said, I miss you, uh, little sister. Um, you know, so it's the, the trauma that's been experienced is not just uh, immediate for the families. It's 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 um, you know extended family. It's neighbors. It's an entire community, and frankly, it's our state and our country. This is a collective trauma that we have to be together to experience and to witness, but also to uh, stand uh, unwilling to to um, see it happen again and to demand change from. Uh, from the from the lawmakers who have the ability to do something uh, to prevent another tragedy. And, and of course, with all of the grief and the sadness that has unfolded, like you said, not only in Uvalde in South Texas, but across the country over the last week, there is a lot of frustration that is accompanied with that. You have talked about your feelings in terms of being frustrated as a, a local leader, a city leader in terms of being able to respond, yes, when something awful like this happens, but not being able to make changes to potentially prevent it. What do you want to see happen? You know, I, I've stood with Moms Demand Action with every town, with the mayors uh, against gun violence. And here, here's the challenge. We have called for and asked for, for our lawmakers to be to take a, a, a stand against gun violence and to make things better in Texas. And over the last 10, 15 years, rather than not just not make things better, they've made things actively worse. And so until we demand change at the ballot box and the folks who refuse to do better are, are replaced, uh, it's not going to change. And, and things from background checks to red flag laws you know, simple things just to make it more difficult for dangerous people to get dangerous weapons. That's all there is. You know, the Texas legislature in the, the last session, 2021, passed a law that prevents local governments from enforcing uh, new federal regulations on firearms. Um, they've passed laws to uh, to um, allow people without a permit to carry a lethal weapon. Uh, they've passed laws to allow folks to carry uh, handguns into schools. Uh, so, you know, the, the list is long and it's indistinguished uh, because of how uh, the, the, the state leaders in this, uh, in this state of Texas have looked evil in the eye, which are acts that we've seen in Uvalde and El Paso and Santa Fe and the list goes on. They've looked it in the eye and rather than try to fight it, they've walked back and made it worse. How do we, I, I asked this question on Sunday uh, and we had just so many powerful messages, mostly from young people that were saying, you know, simply this is, this is not good enough. What are you doing to help me? What are you doing to save me? And, and I'm, I, we, for lack of a better word, it seems as if there's a momentum for something to be done when you have two senators from opposite sides of the political spectrum that are willing yeah. to sit down and talk about gun legislation. How do we ensure that that momentum continues? And I'm not just talking about from a mayor's perspective or from a sure. Stephen Myra perspective from a media. I mean, I, I, how do we make sure that this does not just fade away like so many incidents have in the past? Uh, you know, it sounds simple enough, but we can't forget the little boys and little girls who were gunned down in their classrooms last week. We can't forget them when uh, we get on with our lives and go back to work. We can't forget them uh, when it comes time for early voting 
uh, in, in these November elections. We have to hold folks who have the ability, the authority to do things different and to change for the better. We have to hold them accountable to actually doing it. We have to pay attention to what happens in the legislative sessions. Until voters do that and hold uh, these lawmakers accountable, um, it's not going to change. And so it, it is call to action. Uh, we can do better than this. No one is no one is taking away the Second Amendment. No one is is stripping people, uh, law abiding citizens from their right to to own and carry a gun. Uh, but what we are asking for is to make it more difficult for dangerous people to get dangerous lethal weapons and be able to go into a school and gun kids down. That's not a whole lot to ask. Yeah, I, I just think remember their names. Do not forget them. It has to be a, you know, motto, just not for the next few days or the next month or the next two months. Exactly. But it has to be something that we that we bring to this argument. The, this have. trauma does not does not go away for any of those families and neither should it go away for the rest of the country until we're committed to doing things differently. And Amory Jo Garza, Maita Rodriguez, two children laid to rest today. today. And the community of Uvalde will be going through that process of burying children mm -hmm. for the next month. Just two names that we cannot forget. Mayor, thank you for your time. Thank you all. Have a good night. You too. We'll be right back. The Scripps National Spelling Bee is back fully in person for the first time since 2019, but not without some big changes. Schools and sponsors have dropped out. In 2020, there were 245 sponsors, and now there are 198. Regions have also been consolidated. Yeah, plus the B has fewer than half of the spellers it had three years ago. Another change, Scripps is no longer on ESPN. This year, the B will be broadcast on its own networks, Ion and Bounce. The, comp the competition's finals will air on Thursday, June 8th at 8 o'clock, 7 central. Let's take a look outside with live cam once again. Oh, still plenty of sunshine out there and little heat to go along with that. Yeah, uh, we're it's simply spelled H-O-T. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell me the origins of that word? Yeah, yeah. You, you get to yeah. use it in a sentence right? all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's the origins San Antonio, right? That's where it was derived <laughs> and oh, we can use it in a sentence and no problems. H-O-T, uh, the rest of the week, the weekend, all summer, it's here. 95 right now, 8 o'clock, 88 degrees, 10 o'clock, 82. By midnight, we'll dip down into the upper 70s and a noticeable wind out of the southeast steady at 18 and at times gusting to about 25, 30. That wind, it's gonna stick around. We're gonna talk about the chance of a little bit of moisture coming right up. All right, like we said, it's a very <laughs> warm one. Heat's and, on. You know, yeah. Last day in May, feeling like July, August. No, it really, yeah. When you look at the temperatures, uh, this May has really been more like August around here, which climatologically speaking is the hottest time of year when our average high temperature is up to about 96, 97 degrees. Anyway, small rain chances, they're, okay, they're, they're not 0%. But they're nothing to get excited about. Then hotter this upcoming weekend with some record challenging heat on the way and the potential for some tropical development in parts of the Gulf. And that's interesting situation. So let's get right to it. First of all, with a look at our visible satellite, clear picture from space showing those fair weather cumulus clouds, those patchy clouds streaming overhead and those little dots of green indicating some of the brief light sprinkles or light showers, especially earlier today between I-10 and I-37 right there along the coastal plain, coastal areas had a few sprinkles this morning. And we have that chance again tomorrow with a few afternoon, highly isolated pop-up showers and storms, but only about a 10 to 20% chance. Of course, we've got the terrain circulations over Mexico, even West Texas, at least they're getting some rain. And it's coming at a bit of a cost in parts of the panhandle up into Oklahoma with some severe thunderstorms. That yellow box indicates that severe thunderstorm watch with already several warnings within it. What we're looking at here, this bit of a swirl over southeastern Mexico, uh, Bay of Campeche area, and this is where we have the remnants of what was Hurricane Agatha, which came ashore yesterday about this time on, from the Pacific side of Mexico and southeastern Mexico. 
it's gotten shredded apart quite a bit. There's still a little bit of a circulation and a decent amount of moisture with it. The remnants are likely to move eastward and then pass over the Yucatan into the Caribbean Gulf area, likely developing into another tropical cyclone. Doesn't mean necessarily a hurricane, but a tropical system that could at least become a tropical depression, maybe even a tropical storm. If so, it would be Tropical Storm Alex. That would be within the next five days. Anywhere from about Cancun toward Cuba, all the way into southern Florida and parts of the southern Gulf of Mexico. So odds favor some organization. It would be a good system to hit us, to be honest with you, because there's a lot of moisture with it. it would, it's going to provide a lot of rain to somebody. It's just unfortunately odds are significantly against it pushing any of that rain our way. Most likely scenario is Cuba, parts of uh, basically the Bahamas and maybe even Florida getting soaked by that system and then emerging into the Atlantic off the southeastern United States, potentially with a little bit of development. But around here, all we have is that slight chance, 10 to 20 percent of a few rogue isolated pop up showers or brief downpours in the afternoon every day all the way through Friday. Then this weekend and early next week, nothing but sunshine. I would be surprised if we see a cloud in the sky at that point. 95 right now, dew point is 64, so it feels like it's one or two degrees above the air temperature. But the key is the wind. It's out of the southeast, steady at 18, at times gusting to 31 now. And it's going to stay rather breezy through this evening and into tonight with wind gusts around 25 to 27 miles per hour, even while we're sleeping. So if it's your trash or recycling or green organics bin day in it, tends to pop open in the wind. Well, anticipate that tonight and even first thing tomorrow morning. Let's talk temperatures. Well, 90s, very summer like again. Las Maples right now, 91 comforts, 94 along with Converse, Divine, Castroville, Hondo, 97 degrees, Bernie, 93. We'll start tomorrow at 76 with the low clouds again, dominating the sky. Then we'll break out into sunshine later in the morning by noon, partly cloudy. 90 degrees. We've got that 10% chance of a few brief streamer showers along the coast or a stray rogue pop up downpour in the afternoon. But most of all, just another sunny, humid and fairly hot day. Closer to 100 along the Rio Grande. Eagle Pass about 99 tomorrow. Stone Oak 95, Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, Bernie about 92, 93 for the high. Then we're record challenging territory this weekend. Sunday 100, that'd be shy of the record by one degree. Monday, we're forecasting 101 and that would tie the record for the day. Mm. Ouch. Yeah, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here is today's In Case You Missed It. A man still in the hospital this noon after a shooting just northwest of downtown. That's where police say an argument escalated into a shooting. A 40 year old man taken to the hospital with several gunshot wounds to his chest. That suspect, though, is still on the run. A man found dead with a gunshot wound to his head. It's what San Antonio police found when they responded to an apartment unit at the Cheryl Oaks complex on the city's northwest side this morning. Absolutely. Families from across Texas and really the nation continue to come here and they're coming today right outside of Robb Elementary. If you remember over the last couple of days, this had been closed off to families. They were having to pass on those flowers, but that definitely changed as of yesterday. This as 10 year old Amory Garza was laid to rest just about two miles away from here. Amory's obituary describes her as a sassy and caring little girl. And blood donations have increased over the last week, but the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center say they still need donors. They say since the Uvalde shooting, more than 2,500 donors have helped out here in San Antonio and in Uvalde. Still, the need for blood is great. My head is in the clouds today because this section of the exhibit, it's all about thinking, thinking about the future, thinking about our planet. And this section right here, it's all about energy. We have Meredith with the museum here. All right, so we are powering our city here. We have different forms of renewable energy. Um, so I've got wind, we've got solar, biofuel, and hydropower. And it's representing how through renewable energies, we can feed into a grid. Um, so kids are able to learn about renewables through really fun and interactive and physical way.
This afternoon, there's been some questions about the cooperation from Uvalde police and the police office within the uh, school district there. We have learned from Texas DPS this evening that both of those departments, the Uvalde Police Department and the Uvalde CISD Police Department, are in fact cooperating in this investigation. Who's not cooperating is apparently the chief of the school district, the Uvalde ISD. That is Chief Pete Arredondo. They said that they have requested a follow up interview with him and he is not cooperating at this time. It's a bit of clarification. It also adds to the confusion of this whole thing because earlier ABC News is reporting that both of those entities, the Uvalde ISD and the Uvalde Police Department, were no longer cooperating with DPS investigators. But again, just moments ago, DPS saying those two entities are cooperating. It is the chief of the school district that apparently is not. We're going to stay on top of it. We'll see you at 10.